I yeah, think so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think we are right okay? on time to start the presentation. The first one will be Dr. Kashani that will be talking about imaging. Uh, Dr. Michel, please. Would you yes. like to well, first of all, I would like to welcome everybody and to say how proud uh, we are fr from our friendship. And uh, Mark Humayo is, has been an, uh, uh, an inspiration for all of us and has been the mentor of many of our uh, staff members uh, in our university and uh, Paulista School of Medicine and, and Federal University of Sao Paulo. And uh, many of us had very uh, close uh, friendship with Mark and his team. And today we are going to have a wonderful meeting, I believe, uh, with uh, this title that's uh, a very uh, interesting and provocative one that's new frontiers in vitro retinal surgery and retinal imaging and this is a, a twin uh, meeting between our centers uh, involving the rusk eye institute the Keck medical school university of southern california and federal university of sao paulo paulista school of medicine and uh, we have uh, 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 Rodrigo Meireles, who we will coordinate this session, but we are going to go over subject like uh, subjects like imaging, update in genetics, uh, adv advanced retinal implants, and then we will have another discussion that uh, Otaviano Magalhães, Anderson Teixeira, Francisco Stefanini, Paulo Melo will. Uh, uh, take part of presenting stem cell therapy. So, uh, uh, we are going to have a surgical paper that uh, Marina Heisenblatt will present. Uh, other uh, subjects like anti VEGF injections that we are doing, mainly the work we are doing with the needles and all these kind of things. And uh, we are going to be open for discussions and uh, we are going to close. We have we will have two hours to all of, of this with uh, uh, another challenge for us. So uh, uh, why don't you take over uh, from here, uh, uh, Pira Rodrigo Meirelles. Uh, as I don't know if you know Mark Humayon, Rodrigo Meirelles has this nickname, Pira because he's from a city here in Sao Paulo called Piracicaba. So Pira is his nickname. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and take it over, Pira, now? Thank you very much. Thank you all. It's a great honor to have all your faculty here uh, sharing with us your knowledge. And uh, so let's start. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Uh, Emery that is going to talk about uh, imaging. Please, Dr. Emery. Uh, we can see your screen now. Okay. Okay, great, good. So it is, let's see, let me just make sure I go into the wide, large screen. So you guys can see everything? Yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much for inviting us to be part of this uh, webinar or seminar series. Uh, this is this is exciting. And um, it's, uh, it's good to be in Brazil. I knew I'd be in Brazil soon, but I didn't think like this. So... <laughs> Um, so I'm uh, one of the associate professors here at the Roski Eye Institute, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today are some advanced applications of OCT and geography, which, as you all know, is a very uh, recent um, clinical app, a clinical tool that we're using in our clinics um, to diagnose vascular diseases. So these are my disclosures. We have NIH funding and funding from Carl Zeiss Meditech to support the research studies that you're talking that you're going to see. Uh, these are my lab members and collaborators. Um, a lot of medical students and postdoctoral fellows have contributed to the work that you'll see, and my collaborators in University of Washington and, of course, here at USC uh, are also listed. And this is just uh, some of the lab group uh, last year, I think, some point. Um, so as you all know, OCTA is being used very widely to look at 
a number of retinal vascular diseases. Our group has looked at a number of diseases in the past. We work a lot in diabetic retinopathy, um, but as well as uveitis here in collaboration with Dr. Rao and in vein occlusions. Uh, our group and a number of groups have demonstrated that OCTA angiography is very useful, um, A, in providing a qualitative assessment of the disease, so how much ischemia is there in all these diseases, um, and also in trying to provide some quantitative measures of the disease severity. So not just you know how much like rough ischemia is there, but how much capillary damage is there. And so today I'm gonna to spend some time talking to you about several new applications of OCT angiography. And these are really the take home points. Um, uh, I'm gonna tell you how we're, you're using OCT angiography in a disease called radiation retinopathy, which you're all familiar with to try to quantify the subclinical changes that occur in this disease uh, and hopefully get a better understanding of when it's uh, occurring uh, before its clinical manifestations are evident. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about a new application of OCTA that we uh, published about two years ago uh, that demonstrates we can visualize exudative intraretinal fluid um, using OCTA. Um, and I think this is gonna be an interesting application going forward as well. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to tell you about two new exciting things that are a little bit more on the basic science side, but have clinical applications. I'm going to tell you about some of our work where we're using OCTA to look at retinal vascular function. So not just the structure of the capillaries, but also their function. So are they working well? Uh, and I'm going to show you data that suggests we're able to look at capillary function using OCTA. And lastly, the most recent work we're doing is moving OCTA analysis into the 3D world. So as many of you know, radiation retinopathy is a, a very common occurrence after any form of radiation to the eye and the head. It's got a very similar phenotype to diabetic retinopathy, um, causes endothelial cell damage, and typically occurs between one and two years after the onset of radiation. One of the interesting things about radiation retinopathy is that unlike other vascular diseases, the onset of the disease is very well known because you know when the patient got radiation. Unlike diseases like hypertension and diabetes, you never know when they really became diabetic. So it's hard to do longitudinal studies in those subjects. So we took a cohort of patients with radiation retinopathy in our, in our center and decided to try to study this to see if we can uh, quantitate capillary loss during the course of radiation retinopathy. And this work was done in collaboration with Kyle Green, who was a medical student at the time that you see there. And you can see here in these images, uh, the top, the bottom panel here is the fellow eye of a subject who had a melanoma in one eye that was treated with brachytherapy. So the fellow eye is the bottom eye and it's normal uh, down here. And you can see in the contralateral eye, which is the top row, the patient received brachytherapy. And you can pretty clearly see in large foveal vascular zone, you can see large areas of impaired perfusion in this eye. And so this is not uncommon in patients with a radiation retinopathy. In our cohort of 62 patients with that mean age of about 63, um, we were able to actually show some interesting things. So we did a retrospective single center study of subjects with I-125 episcleral brachytherapy. And we quantified, we wanted to see how quickly do these capillary changes occur. And as you can imagine, uh, if you look at this cohort here, um, you saw that at about two years, 75% of the cohort had clinically evident retinopathy. Um, but at about half a year, six months out after their radiation treatment, uh, only about 6.7% had any clinically evident retinopathy. Uh, what's interesting is that when we looked at our OCTA images, oops, sorry, having a little bit of a problem here. There we go. When we looked at our OCTA images um, and evaluated capillary density using vessel skeleton density, you can see that the capillary density in the non-treated eye, so the eye that didn't re receive radiation is the gray bars, doesn't change over time. And this is over about two years but the capillary density in the treated eye is already significantly lower in the blue bars, even at half a year, when you look at that population of radiated eyes as a whole. So even when you don't see clinically evident radiation retinopathy, we're able to show using OCTA, there's already kind of substructural capillary damage going on. And in fact, if you look over the one and two year periods, you can see that this is clearly progressive and very profound when there is clinically evident radiation retinopathy there. 
And so this is one of the new applications that we are using uh, OCTA for, which is to look not just at clinically evident changes um, and quantify them like neovascularization or large areas of macular ischemia, but try to quantify subclinical changes in diseases like radiation retinopathy. And we have ongoing studies um, in, in other diseases here. And this is uh, in press right now in JVRD. Uh, this is an example of a subject uh, who has uh, radiation to the eye, and this is a baseline here. Just so, and then this is at 26 months, and you can see very subtle changes in the inferior retina where there's decreased capillary density, so that's more blue uh, in the center image, and there's more areas of ischemia, which is white in the flow impairment map. And then you can see at 30 months out, there's lots of areas of impairment, and in fact, it looks like it's almost sectoral in this case. All right, so moving on to an, another one of the exciting applications. So this is a paper we published about two years ago, and it's ongoing work with uh, collaborators that you see on the right. Um, again, some of this was done with Kyle Green, who was a medical student at the time uh, here at USC. Um, and uh, we call this uh, a suspended scattering particles in motion, a totally separate um, application of OCTA. Um, and basically, we think that it's a way of visualizing exudative retinal fluid within uh, patients who have any kind of exudative maculopathy. And so I hope to convince you of that. So we first noticed this here. Uh, when you look at OCT angiograms, sometimes you'll see these blobs, these areas of non-vascular OCTA signal. And it's, uh, it was not quite clear what these were several years back. So we approached collaborators kind of around the world and said, hey, are you seeing this? And in fact, a lot of people were seeing these kinds of changes and we thought it was noise. Um, but in fact, it turns out it's not. If you look at these areas carefully, and these are the cross sections of the OCT, what you see is that there's oftentimes not clear evidence intraretinal fluid or any abnormalities, except there are these hyper uh, reflective white areas, um, sometimes the, that are reminiscent of exudates, but not clearly exudates in these cases. And on fluorescein, there's not always a clearly evident area of leakage or microaneurysm or anything. Uh, and so we took a cohort of subjects from um, all the investigators that you saw who had noticed this. And we saw that people had observed this finding not only in diabetes, but in almost any retinopathy that causes vascular breakdown of the blood brain or blood retinal barrier. So diabetes, retinal vein occlusions, neovascular AMD, radiation retinopathy, macroaneurysms. Uh, and one of the notable things was that it was a very high proportion of people uh, who had hyperlipidemia and hypertension. Um, so if you see more than half of this cohort has uh, more than one vascular comorbidity. Uh, and so here's an example of what this thing looks like. We call it suspended scattering particles in motion, and I'll explain why. Uh, so here's an intraretinal fluid cyst, uh, and adjacent to it, you notice this area of hyperreflective white, um, uh, 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 hyperreflective white lesion, basically. Uh, and if you actually overlay the OCTA flow signal, what you see is there's OCTA flow signal in this cyst on the right side, but not in the left side. And clearly that's not blood flow because that there's no vessels there. And so this is what we're calling suspended scattering particles in motion because we think this is representative of um, kind of proteinaceous um, uh, debris that is exuding from the vessels in that region and causing uh, OCTA signal. And in fact, if you look at the OCTA on FOSS, you can see these large blobs that correspond to the intraretinal cysts that have the um, uh, OCTA signal, the non-vascular OCTA signal. And so this has been demonstrated now by at least uh, two or three different uh, groups um, and uh, is interesting because if you look at these uh, areas of uh, non-vascular OCTA signal where we think there's kind of lipoproteinaceous material, um, these areas over time, and this is one example from our study, tend to resolve in hard exudates. Uh, and so that further kind of supports our hypothesis that this is due to uh, secretion or, or exudation of hyperproteinaceous material. And in fact, we have in vitro models that we show in the paper that help confirm that. Um, so from this, you know, this is a very interesting application because for the first time, we can kind of see the evolution of 
uh, vascular damage um, uh, outside of just capillary density. So this is not, we think that these areas of SPIM are areas where the vascular uh, vascularity is compromised even more than just typical intraretinal fluid. Um, and this may be reflected in how these lesions respond to either anti-VEGF agents or um, other forms of treatment. Um, and there's at least one other group uh, doing longitudinal studies with us to look at how, um, how these lesions respond to different forms of treatment, um, uh, if at all, actually. So this is our a second application um, of, the, uh, of OCT angiography. Um, the last two applications that I want to tell you about, which we've worked on for the last year or two, um, are actually very exciting because I think they take the applications that uh, we commonly use OCTA for uh, and try to move them into the preclinical stages. So um, as you all know, um, you know, we're looking at capillaries and maybe even arterioles and, and uh, definitely arterioles and venules with OCTA. And what we uh, often like to show is that capillaries are not there or capillary, there's ischemia, so absence of structural features um, that are associated with capillaries. Uh, but in fact, in diseases like diabetes, some of the earliest changes in those diseases are caused by impaired function of the vessels. So their impaired ability to react or to autoregulate in response to uh, local metabolic demand. And so what we did with um, Kyle and several other medical students and uh, uh, Senyo, who's one of the postdocs in my lab, is we developed this um, retinal vascular reactivity assay where we are able, through a fairly simple setup, have patients breathe different amounts of oxygen or carbon dioxide uh, and look at the OCTA signal in their eye. And if patients are breathing 100% oxygen, for example, you would expect to see a vasoconstriction res response in the vent, in the ar arteries in the body in general, but uh, also in the retina. And if patients are given a hypercarbic stimulus, for example, 5% CO2, uh, you would expect to see some kind of vasodilatory compensation in the vessels. And, uh, and we're able to do this kind of um, uh, manipulation while patients are actually being imaged on our OCTA devices. Um, and these are the, the FDA approved OCTA devices that you have access to as well uh, and that are available commercially. So there's nothing too special about these um, uh, devices. Um, so here's an example of what this looks like. Here's a normal subject breathing room air here. Uh, and if you look carefully uh, at the foveal vascular zone, especially, you can see that there's you know, these capillaries. And if in the presence of a hyperoxia or breathing 100% oxygen, you can see these capillaries disappear actually on the OCTA. Uh, and, uh, and this is actually reproducible. So you can make it go back and, and come uh, again by having them breathe different levels of oxygen or different gases. Uh, and then if you give the same patient now 5% CO2, you can see that it actually brings back those capillaries that disappeared in the hyperoxic condition. Um, and this is happening throughout the retina, but obviously it's most evident in the fovea where there's only one layer of capillaries. So it's easily visualized there. Uh, so about uh, uh, last year, actually, we published this study um, with the assay uh, and we showed that in normal subjects, which is in the top uh, left panel here in the non-diabetic cohort, uh, these are patients who have no vascular disease uh, that we know of at least, there's actually a very small, but it's a measurable change in uh, the uh, observed capillary density uh, in patients who have in, in, in healthy subjects. So if they breathe CO2, there is a small but significant decrease in the measurable capillary density in the retina. And if you have the same group of people breathe CO2, there's a small but significant increase in the capillary density uh, in their retina as well. And we think this is a representation of the autoregulatory response of the capillaries to the gas, obviously. Uh, and this has been described using other kinds of stimuli like flicker or um, you know, some kinds of isometric exercises that also cause vasoregulatory changes. Uh, interestingly enough, in diabetics, there is actually a, a blunted response um, to this gas provocation. So in diabetics, we don't see any response to the CO2 stimulus at all. And this is even in diabetics who have essentially no, form, no visible retinopathy. 
um, and their response to CO2, uh, to O2 oxygen is actually uh, less in magnitude than in normals uh, and borderline significant in this study. Uh, and uh, we're actually working on another study right now where we're looking at layer specific changes in the retina. So is this happening in superficial or deep retinal layer? Um, and I don't have time to talk about that, but there's some layer specificity in this kind of response. Uh, we think this is a very interesting way of look, using OCTA to look at subclinical changes because it's actually a representation of capillary function. Um, even in subjects who have no detectable diabetic retinopathy clinically, we see this kind of blunted response. And so it could be the earliest stages essentially of what is now clinically detectable using um, FDA approved OCTA devices. Um, all right, and the last topic that I wanna tell you about, which I think is really exciting, but I don't have a lot of data to show on it, but you'll probably hear more and more about it, is that a lot of the um, imaging and uh, representations that I've shown you today and that other people have shown you um, are always two dimensional representations of OCTA. So OCTA uh, is a 3D data set. It's a volume representation of the retina. Um, and in fact, most times when we look at it, we only look at it in two dimensions, which has a uh, very good utility. Obviously, we, we, we do a lot of with it, but it does have some problems because it underestimates vessel density. For example, um, it confounds analyses that involve branching of branching analysis, uh, fractal dimension type of measurements. And uh, of course, it doesn't really help with understanding how these layers are interconnected. Um, one way of getting around it is doing layer specific analysis, but that's, uh, that's also confounded by how you segment. Um, so one thing that we're doing now is actually trying to develop 3D models um, based on the OCTA of the retina. And this is pretty early work, but uh, as you can see here, we're able to generate three dimensional reconstructions of the retina and the retinal vascular uh, capillary or the, the retinal capillaries here, uh, at least in some you know, a low resolution way, as you can see here. And we're actually looking at ways of quantifying those capillaries so that we get three dimensional measurements of capillary volume, uh, branching dimensions, uh, and et cetera, that we can use for future analyses. Um, so I hope that was of some interest to the group as a whole. This is all ongoing work. And I wanted to just give you a broad perspective of the kind of work we're doing with OCTA. Uh, and hopefully these will be applications that you will hear more and more about going forward. Uh, again, thank you to all my lab group uh, for their help and support, as well as to the USC uh, co faculty here for their support. And these are my funding sources. Uh, and I'm happy to take some more questions. And of course, if anybody has questions or is interested in doing some work. Um, you, uh, please <laughs> allow me to uh, comment, uh, make yeah. some initial comments to Amir. Sure. Amir Congratulations for a wonderful talk, very interesting subjects, and a lot, a lot of work behind Thank it. You. <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> but you know, uh, something that uh, always, always worries me as a researcher as well is the clinical implications and the clinical applications for all things that we are working on. For right. example, let's comment on the... Uh, uh, three first uh, situations that you presented. Uh, the early uh, detection and more accurate detection of uh, radiation uh, uh, retinopathy. In that yeah. case, with OCTA, we are ob also observing this. And what would be, uh, you can respond to everything at the end. Sure. Uh, uh, what would be the implications? Because we don't have really a very good treatment for that uh, 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 picture, for that condition. Sure. Uh, if we detect it earlier, uh, we are going to just observe or do we have any uh, clinical implication? Well, the other thing is that the particular noise, uh, suspended particular or uh, that you think that were noise or artifact, this is very interesting because usually we think that something that we don't understand is this artifact or noise? And you pointed out it very well, that's, that you look for to know why, how to explain this artifact. Then you saw that it was not an artifact, it was something that would be uh, 
more a lot more like a dense edema with uh, protein nasus content etc etc yeah. that would be a, a new biomarker for continuation of therapy or response of therapy that would be another question and yeah. the third one i think that the fourth one i would uh, leave alone because you you mentioned it's that's too early etc uh, but it's very, very interesting, too, to see the OCT in three-dimensional way. But the third we would be the early uh, detection of diabetic retinopathy as well. Mm -hmm. What we would do with this uh, knowledge, what we, we are going to treat. And by the way, to, tonight we are going to have a joint meeting with uh, uh, Tom Gardner uh, about re uh, diabetic retinopathy and uh, his... Uh, research on uh, neuro neurosensory uh, uh, aspect of the uh, diabetic retinopathy, and uh, you will be well welcome to participate in our discussion. So, what will you think about the clinical applications of this very nice findings that you you observe? Yeah, so that's those are great questions, and that that's kind of you know where we want to move things. Um, so in terms of early detection, I think it, it, you're right. Right now, it's just we're looking at it and we don't have a lot to do about it. Um, but I think you will uh, agree that even now, for example, uh, clinically, we're often in a dilemma where we're, at least I am in a dilemma where I have a patient who's 20, 20, 20, 30 with macular edema and you know, is not clinically uh, symptomatic, and you're trying to find out, should I treat this patient or not with intravitreal anti-VEGF? And so I think we need to develop biomarkers that are going to detect the disease earlier in that stage or even before that stage, because without those biomarkers, we don't have any measure of how to treat it. Um, and all we measure right now is edema. And edema is probably too late, honestly, uh, when you look at diabetic retinopathy. So my hope is that by understanding what's happening to the capillaries before there's retinopathy, we can actually come up with ways of treating whatever the pathophysiology is of endothelial damage and parasite loss before that happens. So I, I anticipate over the next 10 to 20 years, the treatment will be a paradigm shift from treating edema, neovascularization, and hemorrhage to treating capillary damage, parasite loss, endothelial cell loss. Um, that's kind of my, my, my interpretation of how that will work. Uh, and the same thing for SPIM as a biomarker. You know, we have intraretinal fluid that is very responsive, quickly responsive to anti-VEGF or steroid. And we have intraretinal fluid that's not. Um, and we oftentimes don't understand exactly why that's the case. Um, or sometimes people respond after, you know, 10 injections or four injections or, you know, need constant injections rather than a few. And those differences in the response of people are probably based on some elements of the vascular competence. Um, and by being able to measure both the uh, competence of the capillaries uh, as well as their reactivity, I think we might have some way potentially of predicting who's going to respond well um, and hopefully titrating the treatments more appropriately. But those are those are my guesses, and hopefully, uh, you know, we'll we'll be able to show something more as we as we progress. But thank you for your questions. Those are exactly on my mind. Dr. Kashkani, uh, it's a very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm very excited about those uh, volume rendering images, and we've seen some um, published papers about uh, maxial lesions having uh, anastomosis, even in the, the beginning of the disease, without uh, full cor uh, choroidal neovascularization. Have you seen, have you had the opportunity to test those OCTs in, those, uh, in that type of disease? Uh, we, we have not actually looked at 3D renderings in MacTel. That would be a very uh, good one. I think Rick Spade actually has a paper uh, on 3D renderings, I think. Uh, either it's in MacTel or RVO, I'm forgetting now. But uh, I think that is a very good application of 3D uh, OCTA because very often when we look at just these la segmented layers, it's hard. First of all, segmentation is almost meaningless when you have edema because there's just the layer is not there. You can't segment a layer that's not there. 
um, and we try to draw lines this way and that way and all around it. But if there's no layer, you can't segment it. So you have to take the, the whole retina as a whole um, and look at it. And I think in diseases, like you said, like MacTel, there's just some layers are not there anymore. So no matter how you segment it, you're going to be wrong because it's just it's abnormal retina. So in those diseases, especially, it's going to be important to look in 3D and see what is changing and try to use volume measurements rather than density or, or, or um, two-dimensional measurements. Um, how exactly? I'm not sure, but hopefully I'll tell you next year. <laughs> so Dr. Caio has one question and then we can move forward. Sure, sure. A very, very nice uh, talk, Amir. And uh, Thank you. Are you doing any, any uh, research with correlation uh, with the capillary dropout with function? Because sometimes it is, we have this kind of capillary drop, dropout, but we don't see any, any change on microperimetry. Yeah, so microperimetry is a very interesting uh, additional tool. We're actually trying to do a study where we correlate OCTA and microperimetry, and that's, uh, that's uh, not going as quickly as I was hoping, but because registering the images is a little tricky. Um, but I guess to answer your question, um, you, when, you, when you talk about capillary dropout on an OCTA, it's very tricky because there's, there's a flow detection limit, right? So you can have flow that's below the detection limit of the OCTA machine. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, what, what is, it kind of makes you think about what truly is capillary dropout. We think about capillary dropout as a capillary is just gone, right? When we think about it, it's just gone and that's the permanently damaged. And that's probably not true. Uh, our work using the gas uh, provocation test shows that you can actually, capillaries can come and go. So there's some, um, there's some reserve amount of capillary function where a capillary can just, you know, perfuse or non-perfuse. So uh, just because the capillary is gone on one OCTA exam doesn't mean it's not there. Um, and in fact, a couple of other people have shown that uh, sometimes it's just not perfusing in that particular se uh, second when the OCTA was being taken. So I think we have to reevaluate what we mean by capillary dropout um, going forward. It, it's not quite clear to me what that means anymore because capillaries are not always perfused. Uh, Rodrigo, we just got Mauricio Maia in our screen and he, I think, is wearing a clothes that is prepared for a carnival here in Brazil. Why don't you appear and Mauricio just say he hello and then we are going to move to Hussein Ameri uh, talk. My friend, uh, first, thanks for this, to join us. I'm not in Carnival, I'm seeing patients, Michel, with our fellows. But, you know, this coronavirus is a little bit crazy, you know, so we have to wear like, so I'm sorry to be uh, delaying our meeting and let's move on. Thanks, Mark, for coming and thanks for our colleagues. Good to see you guys. So Let's uh, move now. Dr. Amiri is going to show his presentation about uh, genetics, hereditary disease. Thank you very much, Dr. Kashani, for your excellent talk. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Good to see everybody. While Hussein's preparing his presentation, morning, I just sorry. like to, oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm just telling that uh, Amir, Mark, and Hussein there are actively looking for postdoc fellows to go to USC uh, and maybe do some research with them. They are always asking me for people from our service to go. If the fellows are watching this and maybe they want to, you know, communicate and see if there's any possibility of, of cooperation, uh, just let me know and we can probably
introduce you to Jose and Mary, uh, Amir and Mark, and maybe you may be able to go as we, we did. Okay. Thank you, Rodrigo. That sounds great. Yeah. It was great yeah. having you guys. Good morning, everybody. I'm Hossein Amiri. I'm Assistant Professor of uh, Clinical Ophthalmology uh, here at USC Rossia Institute. And I see patients with uh, retinal degeneration. Um, I did uh, you know, several years of research uh, under Mark uh, leadership on retinal prosthesis and other uh, projects. And that's where we met Anderson and then uh, it's nice to it's, meet you virtually and uh, a pleasure to be here. Today I'm going to give you an overview of gene therapy on uh, retinal uh, dystrophies. Let me minimize that, okay. This is my financial disclosure. Um, retinal dystrophies or inherited retinal degeneration are a group of disorders with, uh, that can be classified in different ways and uh, they they're basically heterogeneous and uh, some of the most well-known of them are uh, rhinitis pigmentosa, labor congenital amaurosis, Stargardt disease, choroideremia, and X-linked retinal schesis. Um, the diagnosis is primarily uh, clinical, uh, which often they are um, bilateral and symmetrical. And as you can see in this case of uh, retinitis pigmentosa, uh, let me, I should bring my, uh, you see with bone specular pigmentation, uh, vascular attenuation and uh, disc pallor. OCT can uh, show the, um, in this case, you can see that even, even uh, though that the subfoveal area looks pretty normal, as you go further away from the center, you see that there is an outer, nucle outer nuclear loss and uh, easy and easy disappear. Also, autofluorescence is helpful in um, making diagnosis in uh, times that it's not uh, clear whether this is something inflammatory or infectious or, uh, or, or uh, dystrophy. And in cases like rhinitis pigmentosa, there is usually hyper autofluorescence of posterior pole and hypo autofluorescence of spots in the mid periphery. Um, some of the um, gene defects may have double ring peculiar form of autofluorescence, but in general, there's a big overlap in, in all of those. And uh, ERG, uh, Goldman visual fields are other tests that can be used and often ERG is uh, flat by the time the patient is uh, symptomatic, flat or near flat. The ultimate diagnosis comes with uh, uh, genetic testing, although uh, even genetic testing in 40% of cases, it doesn't give you a clear diagnosis. There are approximately 300 genes causing IRD and more than uh, 80 genes have been uh, discovered to cause mutations and then cause for a nice pigmentosa. To review uh, gene therapy, let's go back to basics. From DNA, uh, mRNA is transcribed and from mRNA, protein is uh, translated. If you uh, take this double-stranded DNA and look at the um, coding strand, most of the uh, inherited diseases and are caused by a single nucleotide mutation. Uh, and uh, in, in this case, what happens, either there is no um, protein produced or the protein which is produced is abnormal in shape and function um, and uh, basically is ineffective. Gene therapy, is manipulating genes, uh, which could be uh, insertion or deletion or combination of both. And, and the purpose of that would be to restore function or sometimes silence a gene. Um, it can be used for inherited diseases as well as acquired conditions. And also it can be combined with um, cell therapy. One of the uh, most common methods of uh, gene therapy is gene augmentation or replacement, which we replace the missing basically gene. It can be done by inserting a DNA into the cell or uh, an RNA. RNA usually um, stays in the uh, 
cytoplasm. And it, because it's not stable, it's not really a good way of um, expressing a gene uh, long term. So because of that, um, gene augmentations in the eye so far have been on uh, using DNA. Now, how do we um, deliver uh, genes to the target cells? It, we can use either viral vectors or non-viral methods like electroporation, which you create some holes in the cell membrane, uh, or using nanoparticles that can carry the gene. The most common and most efficient uh, way of uh, transferring genes is to use viruses. We insert the gene of interest into the virus and they are naturally made to attack cells and enter the cells. When they ent enter the nucleus, they, I, they, the DNA, the piece of DNA that we want becomes circular and remains there in episomal uh, form and uh, theoretically, forever uh, expresses the um, protein of interest. Um, the, there are different viral vectors that uh, are used in the eye. The AAV or adeno associated virus is the most common one as the safest one. It's not, it doesn't cause immune reaction and uh, generally, um, and uh, does not integrate into genome. It's also very good in transducing RPE and photoreceptors when injected subretinally and for uh, ganglion cells when injected intravitreally. The problem with AAV is that it has a small cargo capacity of 4.8 kilobase pair, which means that um, some of the common uh, genes like ABCA4, RH, uh, I'm sorry, ABCA4, H2A, and others cannot be carried by um, this uh, vector. Now, the other one is lentivirus, which has a much uh, bigger, almost twice cargo capacity, uh, and is good for transducing uh, um, RP cells. Transducing meaning that uh, transferring basically the transgene to, to the cell of interest. And, uh, but it's not good for transduction of photoreceptors. Uh, the other uh, issue with that is that it does integrate into the uh, host DNA, and because of that, it may cause some off-target effect, which is not wanted. The last one is adenovirus, which has almost the same size cargo capacity as uh, lentivirus, but there's a guarded form which has a huge cargo capacity and can carry almost any gene. It's pretty good for uh, transducing many cells in the eye, but has a big disadvantage and that is causing significant cell mediated immune response. And because of that, adenovirus has never been used in any um, clinical trials in the eye, human clinical trials, even though in um, its number one viral vector used in clinical trials in, in the body overall and especially in cancer uh, clinical trials. Now the question is that how um, we deliver that uh, in the eye. Well, um, eye is one of the best organs for gene therapy because uh, in others you have to often uh, inject uh, the gene uh, and, and virus into the um, systemic circulation uh, to reach, or even if you inject it into the organ, it still is gonna diffuse into systemic circulation easily. Whereas in the eye, you can directly deliver it into the eye. It can be done with intravitreal injection, which is good for um, inner retinal transduction if your target is uh, ganglion cells like in labor hereditary optic neuropathy. But if your target is RP cells and photoreceptors, uh, which we intend to in cases of IRD, um, it's not a good way of that. It, it cannot easily cross the um, it, retinal layer, especially uh, ILM. It also elicits immune response, you know, even though it's not very severe, but there is some uh, evidence that it uh, uh, causes immune response and may also be affected by neutralizing antibody because almost um, you know, a third to half of people have this neutralizing antibody that when you inject intravitreally, immediately neutralizes the virus. Now, and the other method is to in, 
inject into the subranguler space, which is um, excellent for transducing RPE and photoreceptors and does not elicit immune response. Uh, the problem with that is that it requires surgery, creating a blab, and with that comes some of the complications. But the bigger problem is just that limited distributions. If you compare with when you do intravitreal injection, you distribute your transgene to the entire retina, whereas here, it's only limited to the area of blab formation. Other uh, methods of gene uh, delivery in the eye are ciliary body injection and encapsulated cell technology, which uh, genetically modified cells basically are placed in a container and then you implant it into the eye. There have been uh, 35 clinical trials on IRD. Uh, it's actually now becoming more. Um, and uh, you, if you look in the left column, uh, the diseases that have been targeted have been labor congenital amaurosis, LCA, uh, choroideremia, Renais pigmentosa, achromatopsia, Usher-1b, Stargardt disease, and extinct retinal schesis. And you can see in the column uh, three on the left, uh, genes that are, have been targeted. Interestingly, uh, from uh, these, only two of them have reached uh, clinical uh, trials, one for LCA, uh, RP65, and the other one uh, for choroideremia, uh, CHM. When it comes to using uh, viral vectors, um, uh, they're, all of them use AAV, except two, uh, you can see for Usher-1B and for Stargardt disease that they use lentivirus. The reason is that both of these genes are too big to be carried by AAV. And also the, the method of delivery has been subretinal injection in all, um, except one uh, for excellent retinal schesis that has been intravitreal. The reason is that uh, surgically it's complicated to uh, create a blab in patients with retinal schesis is associated with high risk of retinal detachment. In um, 2017, FDA approved the first uh, gene therapy uh, for the eye and the first uh, gene therapy for any inherited uh, disease. Vertigin napalovic Brazil, or the uh, trade name of Luxterna, uh, was approved for RP65 mediated uh, IRD. Uh, RP65 is a um, um, essential enzyme in the visual cycle, uh, which is uh, um, responsible for 16% of cases of LCA and accounts for 2% of somewhat recessive cases of RP. Yeah, overall cases of RP, um, probably there are less than 1% of them have RP65 mutations. The journey to um, RP65 becoming available is actually took about um, two decades. In 1993, uh, it was discovered first. Then in 1997, uh, it was found that mutations in, um, the, uh, in RP65 is associated with labor congenital lumbarosis. Only took four years after that to treat rear dogs with uh, this uh, disease, um, and uh, which is remarkable when you uh, think about it. And uh, it, the study showed that um, dogs that received subrenal injection improved, but the ones that received intravitreal injection uh, did not show improvement in their vision. Subsequently, phase one and two clinical trials uh, were performed, although because of the um, lack of a significant interest on gene therapy in that time, it took really a long time to get to the phase three clinical trial. The phase three clinical trial that led to the approval <laughs> included 31 subjects, 21 treatment and 10 control patients. <clears throat> and uh, interestingly, uh, unlike other common methods of um, endpoint measurement that uh, often is used, OCT, visual acuity, or visual field are used. Uh, in this one, FDA requested to use a, more of a, a functional vision test and 
uh, here, uh, multi-luminance mobility test or MLLT um, was used. This is a um, test that uh, basically is like a maze with uh, some uh, uh, obstacles at different heights. And the person, you know, walks through a course and you, you see whether, you know, it hits an object or not. And this study showed that, and then you can also adjust the light to make it from very bright light to very dim light. The study showed that <clears throat> uh, those who received uh, treatment, which was bilateral in both eyes, and uh, showed significant improvement in their mobility in dim light, and 65% of them were able to um, basically function, go through the course in the lowest mobility, in the lowest luminance of that uh, <clears throat> study, which was one lux. So um, there, uh, there was also improvement in light sensitivity and visual field and visual acuity, although the change in visual acuity was not statistically significant. The question everybody um, has in mind uh, is that, is this something that is permanent? Well, the answer is not really clear yet. We have to wait and see what the uh, patients that are getting the treatment now uh, are showing in the coming years. But uh, there were two studies here showed that unfortunately, despite improvement in visual function, cells continue to degenerate. Having said that, these are two um, groups that they did not have really um, a similar uh, type of um, success with um, RP65 gene therapy to begin with. There were three groups working on RP65 gene therapy and only one of them had uh, good results. The reason is that in gene therapy, there are many small steps into it that everything has to be really done right and optimally for that to be successful. Um, in IRD, there is loss of function first and followed by loss of cells. So animal studies showed that if you intervene early, when you have just loss of function and no significant loss of cells, it does prevent degeneration. Whereas if you do late, um, it, the degeneration will continue despite uh, initial improvement in function. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> there are some challenges with gene therapy. Um, <clears throat> one of them is that um, it's gene specific. So meaning that for, uh, for 300 genes, for every single one of them, you have to start from the in vitro studies, then do animal studies and do clinical trials. What happens with this then when you get to the clinical trial, um, it, you have a small, already are, these are rare diseases. For example, RP is one in uh, 4,000 people have RP. And imagine you divide that to um, 80 groups. Then you end up with really having a small uh, sample of patients for clinical trials. And if you're lucky enough to develop a treatment, then you're gonna have difficulty finding patients that can receive that treatment. And, and this is something that, um, that means that there is going to be an less financial incentive for companies to invest on that because even when they develop the treatment, there's not going to be much return into that. Um, the other disadvantage, uh, um, so the other challenge of, I would say, uh, is, is gene therapy is that it, uh, you have to have some uh, cells that are alive because you, had, you need to live cells to put the gene into. So if somebody has advanced uh, RP, for example, with uh, outer and loss, then it's not gonna be um, suitable for this treatment. <clears throat> now, uh, I mentioned that still is not clear whether this prevents you know, degeneration or it just uh, initially improves the uh, vision, although initial studies in humans says that uh, it, it, it may not be permanent. And uh, challenges with viral vectors that I mentioned uh, that really AAV, which is a good one, cannot carry the large one, and then lentivirus is not a good to uh, transducing um, uh, photoreceptors. We have to 
uh, wait and see for better viral um, vector uh, development and non-viral means that uh, there is significant uh, research is going on and we will have them at, at some point. Uh, one other um, issue with uh, gene augmentation that it is not uh, sufficient for most osmol dominant uh, conditions. Because in osmol recessive and X-linked, which all the clinical trials, by the way, have been on those, uh, you have um, missing genes that are not functioning. So if you replace that, then you can um, you know, theoretically cure the disease. Whereas in osmol dominant conditions, the abnormal allele um, it produces an abnormal protein, which has kind of toxic gain of function, um, and uh, it, it acts basically negatively. And if you want to really have a successful treatment, you need to um, uh, the, um, basically uh, disable that gene first. This is an area that I'm interested in. I use CRISPR, and we're working on to uh, treat osmal dominant conditions by disabling the uh, abnormal gene and replace it with, uh, then through a replacement with a normal variant. Another um, way of gene uh, augmentation is optogenetics, um, which is fascinating. This is to transform the ganglion cells into uh, photoreceptors using channel rhodopsin. Um, and there was uh, a clinical trial several years ago in the left. There is another clinical trial, say, uh, phase one and two um, that uh, going. And in the right-hand side, you can see that there was uh, another one. Several groups are working on this. And um, although I have not seen really a publication on that, but um, they announced that something is promising. We have to wait and see. Uh, there, in the right-hand side, you see this clinical trial has started and they, they did their first treatment uh, just last June, a month ago. Now, optogenetic has a big advantage uh, that is non-specific. So anybody with any gene defect is suitable for that. Also, um, it, it can be used for advanced disease from the um, studies of morphometric studies of Mark and his colleagues on retina of patients with retinoid pigmentosa, we know that even when these patients have um, total loss of outer nuclear layer, uh, still they have uh, some uh, significant number of bipolar cells and ganglion cells are alive. And for that reason, uh, similar to Argus 2, even when the patient has um, the advanced disease and NLP could potentially benefit from this treatment. The issue with uh, optogenetics, though, is that um, it, the vision recovery may not be the same as when you get with uh, when you um, correct the gene defect in photoreceptors, because this way, uh, the, all the complex renal processing in the retina in different layers is bypassed. But we have to wait and see really what these patients see and how they see it. Um, in summary, uh, there have been uh, over 35 clinical trials on gene therapy for IRD, and all of them uh, so far have been gene augmentation. Uh, one of them received uh, FDA approval, and there is one uh, in phase three clinical trial for chorouremia. And if the results go well, so that could be the next available treatment for um, IRD, hopefully, uh, in, in coming years. And uh, as I mentioned, gene augmentation is gene specific, um, except um, optogenetics that uh, is promising in, in, in that sense that can also be used for advanced disease without, regardless of any uh, gene defects. Uh, uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and I'll be happy to take any question. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussain. Uh, is there any- oh, I have a question. Sure, okay. yeah. Okay, uh, I have a question for Dr. Hussein and also for Dr. Juliana from our side here in Brazil. Uh, I would like to know what's the percentage of patients with retinitis pigmentosa uh, that have the mutation in the two alleles 
of the RP65, even in US and in Brazil. Okay, okay so the their percentage is very low. It's only, uh, so osmol, retinoid pigmentosa can be osmol dominant, recessive, and excellent. So this accounts for 2% of, um, even less than 2% of uh, patients with osmol recessive only. So it's very a small number of patients have that. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, Juliana, it, it is different here in Brazil or is the same uh, epidemiology? That's exactly the question I, I would like to, to ask him, but you, you did it first. Uh, because I have never seen such a patient. Uh, all the patients I, I saw with RP65 are uh, LCA patients. They might be an older patient that was not diagnosed as a LCA when they are young. Mm -hmm. So when uh, times uh, had passed, they received the name of uh, RP, but indeed they are LCA that was uh, fine later. So uh, from the LCA group, uh, it's kind of 15% of the patients that we have with this G in Brazil from, from uh, about 150 patients that I've been following. So thank you for your lecture. Wonderful to see everything organized in the way you did. Uh, the other question I, I would I like to ask you is about the, the new trials that are uh, being done for exactly the same gene. So there are two, a, a new trial for RP65. There are three trials coming for RPGR. How can you see this amount of trials in such a rare disease? Uh, what are the best results in, um, in each of, of them? Uh, so, you know, so that's, that's actually um, an, an excellent question. Can I go back to the previous question also that, um, as you pointed out, uh, with uh, these um, um, IRD, we see that there's a lot of overlapping in terms of phenotype and genotype. So basically we see a gene, gene defect like, for example, ABCA4 causes, known to cause a Sargard disease, but can cause rhinitis pigmentosa, can cause cone dystrophy, cone rod dystrophy, and Similarly, you know, for um, the uh, RP65, the same way um, that we see uh, that mm, RP65 can, can cause LCA and RP. And really the distinction that is that is something that we make, you know, when it expresses early, we call it LCA. When it later, we call it rhinitis pigmentosa. In terms of other clinical trials, you know, so um, I don't know exactly why, you know, there, for example, as you say, even with the small market, why um, there are new trials, because even if they develop a treatment, it's really going to be very difficult to find um, enough patients for that. But people, um, there are other basically um, uh, factors going into that. For example, you know, some people may really believe that their treatment is better. They may be able to secure a, a funding. And in terms of what the results of that are, uh, I tend to not um, go with what they claim. I only um, see what is presented in papers, peer-reviewed papers, because I've seen that sometimes people go in a meeting and present a really fascinating results on their clinical trial. And then when their paper comes out, I see a totally different thing. And one of them was the, the same, a, a different group that worked on um, RP65 a few years ago. This, this goes back about four, five years ago. Really, I was fascinated when I watched these um, presentations in uh, AAO and other places. But when their, their paper came out, uh, I, I realized that even though they claim that it's improvement, there was only one improvement in one functional vision out of nine or 10 different things that they had uh, measured. So for that reason, really, I don't know um, that what, because they have not published it, I don't know what the result is. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Dr. Hussein. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to invite our friend, uh, Mark Humayo. Uh, I would like to 
in name of our department uh, to be thankful for all the speakers, especially for Mark, who accepted a lot of fellows from our service in the US. Mark, you are a gentleman, a great friend, and you are an uh, example of scientists for us here in Brazil and professional. We admire you a lot, and thanks a lot for this uh, uh, meeting, this joint meeting, which for us is a great honor. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mauricio, and uh, great to be with you. So I guess I can share my screen now. Is that the next step? Yes. Please. Which one should I click on, though? There's a share screen um, at the top of your screen. There should be a little green button. Oh, I'm sorry. At the bottom of your screen, there's a little green button. Yeah, yeah in the bottom. The yeah. Okay. In the bottom. And then you select whether you want to share your whole screen or just one window. Okay, one second. Uh, share. Okay, when I hit share, the little blue button, right, Amir? The, there's a little, in the middle of the screen on the bottom, there's a little green button. It's just share screen with a green arrow going up. Yeah, I hit that. Then it comes to another screen, which says, give yeah. me a bunch of options. Then you got to pick, uh, you got to pick the window you want to share, or you can share your whole desktop. So you have to say what it is you want to share, and then you push the, the share button or the proceed button. Okay, got it. Share. I just Don't share the bank account screen. <laughs> Open security and privacy systems now. So, oof, okay. Let's make it. Maybe you need an electrical stimulation. <laughs> hey, look at this, man. Let's do it. You know, don't, yeah, don't share any of the uh, the top secret stuff. Don't share that. <laughs> oh, man, it's asking for all kind of weird passwords. The other day it worked, but uh, let's see now, Amir. Um, let, uh, I don't know if you can share your screen with me. If you hit... The share screen, let me see what else it gives you. Yeah, so if you hit the share screen, you get a bunch of blue stuff, right? Yeah, and, and I hit the desktop, and then it takes me to security and privacy. Oh, uh, you must have some kind of uh, firewall. That, so, well, just whatever your password is for your um, for your desktop is probably the same password you have to enter. So just and uh, whatever you do to log in. Okay. Yeah, it just, you're going to have to let Zoom uh, access your presentation. So just type the password you, you use for open the computer and you will allow you. But maybe you have to get out of Zoom and come back maybe after that. Really? Yeah. Try that. Uh, enable the password and see if you can share. If you can't share, they will probably tell you to get out of Zoom and come back. Um, Sorry, guys. Hi. Sure. Yes. Uh, maybe while uh, okay, there we go. Is doing this kind of ah, here we go. Okay. Uh, worked. Hold on one second. Is it working now? Um, mm, nope. Oh, we are not able to see Mark. Sorry, guys. My apologies, General. Firewall. Firewall. Privacy. Okay. Uh, Zoom will not enable the record contents of your screen until it's quit. So quit now. Yes. Okay, I'll come back. Okay. Uh, maybe we can discuss a little bit more about gene therapy. Uh, actually, for the, for our side here, we expect to have the Luxturna treatment uh, approved in 30 days. The oh. last conversation I had with uh, Novartis. 
And I would like to ask to Dr. Hussein, in the real life uh, scenario, Hussein, how are the patients uh, going with the treatment? They are the retinitis pigmentosa patients. How are they feeling? Okay, so um, the, we are, the, the RPC survive here in the US are limited to uh, several centers and, uh, and CHLA is one of the centers that CHLA of US, USC. I'm not personally the one that does it. Uh, and uh, there's Aaron, Aaron Nigal is the one at CHLA who does the, um, uh, the gene therapy. And often these are patients that come from somewhere else, they get their treatment and they go there. From several that I have received feedback, there is, it's a mixed uh, uh, basically response. Uh, some of them really show very good recovery, especially at uh, dim light, their vision improves significantly, but there are others that don't show significant improvement. We, we see your presentation, Mark. Okay, we can see your presentation, Mark. Thanks, Hussein. All right, you're welcome. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Mark, can you hear us? Mark, can you hear us? Mark, you, you are muted. You have uh, to let's... open your microphone. Unmute. How, how about that? Can you Good. hear me now? Yes. yes. OK. Well, you guys yeah. can hear me now. You can see my slides. Sorry for the delay, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so uh, basically, we'll talk about advanced retinal implants. And, uh, you know, uh, basically, Michelle and I remember when we were retinal surgeons, and we were able to do a lot of surgery. And now, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of injections. So the question is, is there any role for surgery in the era of injections that we're doing? Uh, and I believe they are, and they're related to retinal implants. So... If we could uh, go to the, yeah. So here are my financial disclosures and really they pertain to the top uh, two uh, regenerative patch technologies is developing the stem cell implant. Uh, second site was developing the retinal implant. Uh, I'm happy to report to you guys on the call here that we have started another company which is developing a retinal implant and the retinal implant will have 256 electrodes. So a lot more than the Argus two. And we're gonna be starting clinical trials within the year. So that's just for you guys, some interesting information. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I think when you look at unmet medical needs like this, um, you know, it's a difficult problem. You have to approach it from all different ways, pharmacological therapies, gene therapy, cell therapy, and surgical therapies. So if you look at heart disease, you look at cancer, you look at anything complicated, it's not one thing fixes all the problems. You need to approach it from different angles. Uh, and that's what we're doing here. So I think this audience knows very well that the eye, in fact, is the organ which receives the most implants, the world's most common implant is the intraocular lens. And it started with uh, this gentleman here, Sir Harold Ridley, who was knighted by the queen. And he realized this plane here that there was a Spitfire plane where the canopy, when it was shot, the plastic went in and instead of removing it, it was better to, um, to leave it in the eye. And that started that development. Now. Everything is not, we know in tracker lenses now, but he went through a lot of challenges and the technology almost nearly died because of complications. They were using anterior chamber lenses and then they, they figured it out to make sure the cornea doesn't fail, glaucoma doesn't occur. Uh, and then, you know, we are where we are now as we know it. So these implants and these techniques do take some time, but the eye is, in fact, the leader in implants for the front of the eye. So now let's enter this era. There are sophisticated microelectronics. Uh, we'll be talking about a few of them, but there are a lot of other ones. People are putting uh, technology on contact lenses. As you can see, Google, and I'll talk about Elon Musk and Neural Lace a little bit in just a minute. 
So uh, what are we doing? If somebody asks, we're actually engineering the macula. And uh, that is the theme of this talk. We're going to engineer the macula with different types of implants. So first we'll do the bioelectronic site. And this is what we were just talking about. Inherited uh, with Juliana and Amir uh, and Hossein, sorry, uh, and Juliana. Inherited ret retinal degenerations lead to photoreceptor loss, as you know. Um, that is, they're pretty common when you look at them all as a group, but there's so many mutations. And LCA, whether it's the RP65 mutation, which Osan talked about, or the CEP290, which is Editas, which is another company working on, on fixing that mutation. Uh, you know, this has been a big success. Uh, but again, in my calculation, um, you know, these sorts of gene, gene therapies approachable that have been treated still account for a very small number. They may account for a large number of LCA, these eight mutations, but LCA itself is a very small percentage of, of genetic mutations. So uh, just like optogenetics, which Hussein was talking about, the bioelectronic solutions bypass the damaged neurons. Uh, they're indicated for all genetic defects effect, affecting photoreceptors, um, and they stimulate, but they do stimulate groups of neurons. Uh, so you have to work with the electronic uh, signal and pulse, and you have to get the electrodes close in order for this to work. So um, if you go here, I mean, this is something you know, um, we've always put the camera outside uh, with the video processing unit uh, and the transmitter coil, as you can see here. Um, uh, by the way, can you see my, my mouse or you can't see it? Can you see my mouse? Yes. Oh, you can. Okay, good. So yes, basically, sure. okay. So uh, yeah, I mean, we could put this camera inside the eye. Uh, we've done a lot of work on that, but uh, it's not necessary. You can put it outside. I'll show you some very interesting technological development in glasses, uh, which makes a lot of sense to put uh, the camera outside the eye. Of course, if you put it outside the eye, you know, it doesn't match quite the um, eye movements, but I'll talk a little bit about that. So, um, you know, Second Sight is no longer making the Argus II retinal implants, but as I mentioned to you earlier on, we have another effort which uh, will be making this and it'll still be using an external camera and video processing unit. Um, the implanted part here, you can see, uh, most of you are familiar, this is the receiver antenna, which captures both power and data. There's no, no place to put battery in this. This is the electronic case, and only the cable are put into the eye. So this is put around the eye with only the cable into the eye. And you can see cosmetically it has very good results um, in, this, um, in this patient. The new version uh, that we'll come out with, uh, hopefully is just one quadrant. The chip technology has gotten a lot smaller, so we don't need to put a 360 band. It'll, it's a lot quicker surgery. Um, but here you can see some of the examples of the different devices, not only the Argus, but uh, the Pixium Prima, as you can see here, is a subretinal photodiode approach. We'd heard about this from Optobionics a long time ago, the Chow brothers. Um, this is different uh, being developed by uh, Daniel Palanker at Stanford. Uh, and it does allow a very sophisticated um, goggles to provide a very bright image. Uh, so basically it's able to stimulate this, but this is only for uh, geographic atrophy, uh, not for inherited retinal degenerations. Here you can see the very first in the middle panel B is the Argus one. Some of those of you who work with me uh, know this here on F is, is the Argus two. Then there's the subretinal implants from um, Germany uh, and some other places. All these companies have basically uh, stopped making it for various reasons. And here is the, um, they, they basically, their devices would always fail. So, and here is the implant from Optobionics um, back in the day, but the Argus series has not failed. The reason why it's being stopped being made is because they made a commercial you know, error in the sense that they thought there were gonna be a lot more patients, kind of like what Hassan was talking about. 
this business has, um, you have to be very careful for companies who get into it, uh, the number of patients and um, the, ch the, the charge per implant has to be very carefully figured out and Second Sight didn't do that so well. So it wasn't because the device was failing, um, it was more because of their commercial projections. Uh, when you do get the device positioned properly, as I was saying, it's very good to have the OCT where we can show it uh, very cl closely approximated. This is the shadow from the electrodes into the retina and you can see there's the cable. So only this is the part that's implanted in the eye. Uh, you know, this was uh, implanted in um, more than 400 now, this in many, many countries. As you can see here, uh, we, we wish we had a, uh, a spot there in Brazil, but we'll get there. Don't worry about it. We will get there. Um, so uh, what was interesting is this last, one of the last countries, typically when we launch this product, uh, there's always the Ministry of Health, which is holding the device. But I was not allowed to go to this country because of certain U.S. country relationships. And you can see here why that was the case, because there is Vladimir Putin. So he was there himself and he approved um, the retinal implants, um, the Argus II in, in Russia. Uh, and it was an exciting day. Uh, here's a video. I don't know. Is this playing for you guys? Okay. Yep. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. It's so, so this is from Korea, yeah. and it shows that the vision can really get to 2480. Yeah, one of the things that is very amazing, this is the latest version of it with the latest software, and you can see that these letters are very difficult to draw. And if you're completely blind, uh, it's very difficult to write even in a straight line, leave alone writing these complex figures. So um, a lot of, you know, when we first got started and everybody here uh, uh, knows that when we first got started, we could just see large letters, but you can see how much progression has been made through software improvement and better uh, positioning of the electrode to the retina, of course, uh, this device, the Argus 2, was for orientation and mobility, uh, doing these sorts of activities, as you see, um, and not really for reading. Uh, but the hope is obviously with these newer devices, we can get to reading. This is a very interesting uh, study we did, which is the effect on the brain. So if, you're, if you've been blind for many, many years, your brain doesn't, your visual cortex doesn't sit there doing nothing. It ends up doing uh, taking another sense takes it over. It's called cross modal plasticity. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, you can see here at the top, this patient has RP, very small tunnel vision. And in each row, we gave them a different touch tactile task. So sandpaper, uh, you know, dots, uh, this sort of thing. And you can see at the very bottom here is a patient with, uh, with full visual field. And you can see that this, this little tip is the visual cortex. And you can see that with fMRI, when you have full vision, when you're doing these tasks, of course, the, the touch sensation doesn't map to the visual cortex. But as you become blind and not totally blind, if you have tunnel vision, you can see significant amount of the touch sensation starts to map to your visual cortex. And so this was work with Jim Weiland um, and Bosco Chan, as you can see up here. Uh, but what we did was we implanted and studied it in Argus II. And again, if you look in subject A1, the subject only had the implant for a very short period. Um, and you could see that in this case, even with the Argus, there's a fair amount of color to the each time they did a touch task, still the touch is being mapped to the visual cortex. But in subject two, we implanted the device for much longer. And you can see that now the visual cortex is starting to come back to work for vision and less, less of the touch is going to the visual cortex. So it's coming back to its original sense. So this is exciting work because we can also study not only improvement in the eye, but we can see what happens in the brain and visual plasticity. So what I just showed, with, showed you that 
Argus 2 first started with 20, 1200 vision, big letters. You just saw recent results from Korea, which it gets it to 2480. Uh, with some digital zoom, we'll talk about that. You can get a lot further. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about is color vision is very exciting. Uh, if you have two objects on the desk, uh, you don't know what they are because you have relatively low vision if you're using the Argus and you have uh, late stage RP. But if I give you a little bit of color information, you may be able to tell that's an orange and an apple. So color has important information contact. And here you can see again, if I can give you a little bit of green grass color, uh, you can see there's grass and pavement. So color is not only color for us is nice, but for at low level, it, it is definitely has um, uh, utility in, in seeing things and orientation and mobility. Of course, color is very complicated uh, and we cannot put one electrode. The electrode is too big to put only on the red, green or blue. So how do we do this? Uh, the way we do that is we uh, we use frequency modulation. Some of you know that by stimulating a different frequencies, even, you know, we can see different colors. This is an example of a Benham top, which is a black and white top. If you spin it at a certain frequency, you see different colors. So it led us to think, can you actually change the frequency to see colors? And this is work that Lan Yu did and Hassan Ameri um, is involved in this. He's our local PI for the uh, retinal implants is, um, and you can see that we're able to get many different colors um, by different stimulations. So imagine if we're in Brazil and we're wearing a blue shirt, dark blue shirt and yellow pants, or maybe a yellow shirt and a, and a blue pants, then the frequency from the yellow shirt would be different stimulating the neurons than the frequency from blue pants, but it will get the patient to be able to see blue and yellow, for example. So as I mentioned, uh, one of the reasons to put the camera outside, I always knew that this technology would end up uh, uh, getting better and better. So you can have two cameras, but both of them are not connected, obviously. Only one is. And what it does is the two cameras only allows you to see within three feet, for example, or you could make it six feet. So it basically ignores all the other information and reduces the overload of the visual data. So you can do that. You On all your cell phones, there's a yellow thing, yellow square that comes up when you click on somebody's face. These region of interest finders can also help identify and, and, and make the visual environment less complicated. And lastly, eye trackers are becoming very small. So now you can put the camera outside and it can basically track the eye. You don't have to put it inside and this uh, prevents neck strain and obviously helps with vestibular ocular reflexes. So just as we predicted, these cameras outside are really helpful. So now Elon Musk, very interesting, um, uh, actually had an opportunity to talk to him uh, about this. Uh, he, you know, he believes that there is uh, gonna be a brain machine interface uh, his reasoning is, is different. Uh, we could maybe talk about that in question and answers. But anyway, he started a company called Neuralink and his interface is called Neuralace. It's not for vision. Uh, it's for interfacing brains, uh, you know, with machines, as I mentioned. And so here is the Orion. Uh, Second site is continuing with the Orion um, uh, brain implant. Uh, you can see here this cable was way back in the 1970s. The Orion is down below, which is a wireless interface into the visual cortex. Uh, and it, um, you know, we'll see what comes of it. There have been six uh, patients that have been implanted already. Um, these are some of the other things um, that Hassan already talked about, optogenetics. Um, and um, there is a sensory substitution, which we don't have enough time to get into, but we can talk about that. So with the visual cortex though, for the residents, you remember that it's very complicated. The very center of your phobia is actually on the surface, but then all the other areas uh, get deep into this calocrine fissure. And this fissure is, is got a lot of blood vessels, so it makes it quite dangerous uh, to put the electrodes in. And also uh, remember that if this is um, Sir Isaac Newton's face, 
that the face is very stretched. So uh, this area has different types of geometric uh, abilities. So uh, this is being developed, but some of the challenges are the risk to the adjacent cortex, um, the bleeding and so forth and so on. Uh, but it is something that's being developed. So in my last, quickly in the last uh, talk, I'll talk a little bit about um, another approach, which is another implant. Um, and this is for geographic atrophy. I think we all know these facts here, uh, but the important thing is that this is, um, is to reestablish a host photoreceptor function. So this is very interesting. This is our first chance. We are very lucky in ophthalmology that if we could re uh, help repair the RPE cells before the photoreceptors are damaged, uh, we can address for example, dry macular degeneration without having to do a neuronal transplant. The moment you have to do a nerve transplant, that's very difficult to create synapses. But if you can get in there and put the RPE before the photoreceptors are completely gone, uh, maybe you don't need to do a neuronal uh, transplant. So this is the big advantage we have. Um, this, so this is for primarily for dry macular degeneration where the RPE is damaged and also Brooks membrane is damaged. So we have to create both of them. And this is just to show you where things are. So, okay, so where is the data? This is very interesting information. And it comes uh, from uh, Mauricio is gonna like this. It's not the cage, Mauricio, it's not the rat, but it comes from a squirrel. It's a very interesting fact. Okay, so let's look at the photoreceptor here is the outer segments and inner segment and the nucleus. Well, in a hibernating squirrel and some hibernating animals, they completely get rid of their outer segments uh, and just keep the nucleus. And then when spring comes, they grow their whole outer segments out. So this is a very interesting idea. And the whole concept of can human also have a dormant photoreceptor, meaning that if the RPE goes away, we don't hibernate. Maybe some of us would like to, but we don't. And uh, so um, what happens is that when the RPE goes away, is it the same scenario where the outer segments uh, uh, go away, but the inner, uh, there's no reason why the cell, the nucleus should die. It's not dependent on that. And then the nucleus could grow the, photo, uh, the outer segment. So the concept of a dormant photoreceptor, very interesting. And the question is, can we do it? So here, basically this, some of us remember from autologous RPE transplant, if you take RPE from the same eye from the periphery and you put it in the macula, you get dramatic improvement. So this is proof of concept that in the area of geographic atrophy, if you take RPE from the periphery and put it in, you get dramatic improvements. But of course, because of the large harvest site, retinotomy and retinectomy, 45% uh, led to high complication rates with PVR and detachment. So this led to, okay, let's try to find these cells, not from the same eye, but from uh, exogenous source. So there, there are two types of pluripotent. Pluripotent cells can, er, can give rise to most cell types in the body. Um, you can either get it embryonic or you can get it IPS, so induced pluripotent cells. Um, Yamanaka and colleagues won the Nobel Prize for IPSC. Um, you, you guys know you can take a skin or some other cell from adult, reverse it to a stem cell and then bring it forward to form an RPE cell, for example. Uh, embryonic stem cells are obviously collected very early uh, from the blastocyst phase uh, and then grown uh, from there. Uh, and, but you can have multipotent cells, for example, adult stem cells, but they, they can only give rise to a few cell types. Uh, this is different than injecting autologous fat. Our orthopedic colleagues spin fat, inject stem cells, please. Uh, there have been bad complications from this in Florida, in the US and other places. So we're not talking about that kind of autologous fat cells. In fact, uh, I'll be focusing primarily on embryonic stem cells. So here's a list of all the uh, different types of cells. Uh, most people are doing cell inject suspensions, as you can see in the red, uh, and human embryonic stem cell derived RPE is the top one. And Rodrigo here uh, is going to be talking about its, its use in, in StarGuard, but there are others who have similarly tried this. 
Uh, and there are also a number of other places that are trying it on a scaffold to put it on a sheet. Uh, and the reason why would you want to put these cells on the sheet? Uh, that's complicated. Wouldn't it be just easier to do an injection? And you could see this is very interesting data. You take the same cell, embryonic stem cell derived RPE, the same cell that's polarized. So if you, meaning you put the, the bottom side and the microvilla properly oriented, and then you compare, look over here to the third column, non-polarized cells. On the y-axis is a very important growth factor for the retina. Uh, and you can see once they're polarized, these cells put out a lot of good growth factor for the retina. The same exact cell, when it's not polarized, it's facing sideways or upside down, it doesn't put out. So all this to say is that polarization, this is another important dormant photoreceptor, one idea. Second idea, polarization is very important for these cells to work properly and put out these protective growth factors. So in order to get them polarized, like you see here, we put it on a perylene substrate uh, uh, and and basically everybody said, well, why are you putting this substrate? Why aren't you putting a substrate that erodes away, that just goes away? Why are you putting it on a plastic that doesn't grow, go away? And the reason is if we put it on something that goes away, how do things go away? Well, they either release acetic acid, like in a poly, a polyglycolic uh, uh, is, another, is, is a particular uh, erodible compound. And also macrophages come in to remove these substrates when they're erodible and those set up an immune response. So we don't want an immune response to these cells. So we wanna create an inert substrate. Uh, we were able to, but then you may say, well, okay, this substrate is gonna get in the way of the choriocapillaris uh, diffusion uh, and the photoreceptors are going to die. And so we spend a lot of time making very special membrane, which is uh, at, uh, special features, much, it's made like a computer chip. Uh, and you can see here in this slide that this in the, it has a molecular uh, exclusion in kilodaltons. Brooks membrane has 200 kilodaltons. This has 291. So this is the first uh, synthetic Brooks membrane. It's, the, it's basically same feature size and same molecular exclusion. So, okay, so we have our membrane, we have our cells, we're able to put them in the right orientation, but we needed one more thing. We needed a tool. We needed a surgical tool because if we, this is the membrane with the cells, and this is actually with the help of Rodrigo who helped us a lot with implanting this in the pig eyes, uh, we were able to fold it because if you put this membrane across a sclerotomy with all the fluid, the fluid are gonna be able to push all the cells off, damage the membrane. So we're able to fold it much like an intraocular lens and put it, uh, create a subretinal blab, blab like we do, uh, most people know, and then implant it through a very small one millimeter uh, retinotomy. And here you can see it, the membrane underneath the retina. Um, we did a lot of, this is work now with Amir Kashani, we did a lot of fold and fold to make sure that after folding and then unfolding that all the cells are there. So we inserted all, we gave all this data to the FDA and the FDA said, okay, we did, we did 300 rats. We did all the pigs, you know, as I mentioned, and we got approval to do 20 subjects um, with end stage retina geographic atrophy. So very poor vision, less than 2200. Uh, it's the kind of vision we were going into. Here are the steps, uh, you know, small gauge vitrectomy, uh, create the blab, uh, you know, right here, and then uh, load the membrane, fold it, and then go and un unfold it underneath the retina, uh, PFO uh, attachment, and then, uh, you know, we can, uh, we have it. Uh, so here is, um, this is again, courtesy of Amir. Amir, Amir did uh, most all these surgeries. Uh, you can see here, a uh, very large area of geographic atrophy in the membrane afterwards. Uh, this was published in a paper, so you can look at this. But again, smaller geographic atrophy, you can see the membrane. Uh, and it's very nicely positioned uh, on the geographic atrophy. Um, covers, uh, you know, about almost 87% of all GA, even this very big one here. Uh, but most importantly, covers the phobia in all of them. So 
you can see we really need a big implant for a lot of this GA and therefore folding it. Because if you try to get this implant without folding, you would have to make a large retinectomy, three or four millimeters. The group in London, Lyndon de Cruz et al. did that. They don't have a foldable approach and they started to get PVR at the retinectomy site uh, and detachment. So it's very important. Just like in, in cataract, you wanna be sub three millimeters, close to two millimeters with the cataract incision. Similarly, it's very important to keep the retinotomy incision small and therefore use this foldable um, approach. This is some very exciting data on our last couple of slides. Here, um, post-operative day one, the good thing is our implant, we've engineered it so it looks different. It has a different refractive index than the retinal tissue so we can see it. You can see on post-op month two, you can see a little fuzz. This is the RPE layer. And very excitingly, we started to see early formation of external limiting membrane, uh, which we didn't have before. So what does this mean? External limiting membrane, remember, is demarcates the nucleus from the outer segment. So could it be that indeed there were, there were not all the photoreceptors were dead. People ask, well, how do you, why do you see improvement in this area? Aren't the photoreceptors all dead? But we're thinking too simplistically. Some of them are all dead. Some of them may in fact be dormant. They may have the nucleus, but what they need to do is have a healthy RPE to be able to grow their outer segments back. So very exciting area of the dormant photoreceptors. What did this mean? We're doing, Amir is looking at all the data. We hope to have a publication out very soon, but you can see here some functional, early functional data on the, on the microperimetry. You can see that the fixation was very unstable. Uh, and then after the implant, the fixation became uh, within two degrees, uh, very stable here over the implant. You see the implant here. Uh, so to return foveal fixation from being eccentric to being over the implant is again, another uh, very good indicator. Uh, we were able to, because of these results, we were able to get the cover of science. Uh, this is the magazine for their translational medicine. You can see this very beautiful implant and the little retinotomy is very, very tiny, just underneath this vessel, you can hardly see it. Um, so with that, I'd like to, hopefully what I've done is, you know, sh shared some of the advanced implants, uh, some of the, uh, you know, the, the challenges with getting these implants in for the Argus you, uh, or epiretinal implants, bioelectronic implants, you have to get them very close to the retina for them to work. Uh, without crushing the retina. The subretinal implant, you have to get it through a small retinotomy and position it in, uh, in over the fovea and most of the geographic uh, atrophy area. Uh, again, improvement in, in 3D printing, uh, nanoscale fabrication will help a lot. And also the interest of non-medical corporate partners. You know, I just mentioned Elon Musk. They're all getting into this space, Google uh, with their glasses, et cetera. So it's going to be exciting to see where this goes. Uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge, again, I already mentioned Hussein here, Lan and myself for the uh, bioelectronic implant, and then for the stem cell program, uh, Amir here already mentioned, uh, we, uh, and the rest of the group here, City of Hope. So uh, lastly, you know, I'd like to thank, of course, you guys know better, patients really are so important for these trials. And this was the day that the FDA approved the Argus implant and our patients were there to convince them and all our funding for sources. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. So turn it back to you. Okay, Mark. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, presentation. It uh, demonstrates quite well how uh, a line of research can last forever so it's a uh, whole life research a lot of work has been done a lot of work has to be done yet and uh, it seems that we are approaching a phase where clinically we can uh, use more in and more in patients with the more useful uh, uh, utilization and 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 uh, uh, profit of, of, of its uh, value. Uh, uh, one technical 
technical things that I would like to ask is when you, uh, in this kind of implant where you have a platform that is unfolded under the retina, uh, how uh, to avoid that it unfold in the opposite direction? Uh, or uh, then in this situation, we will have a problem of polarization, as you mentioned. Yes. And the instrument is able to keep it uh, unfolded in the right way always. Is to have a, a way to do it with the... Uh, uh, the, to make sure that is in the right way, or sometimes, like in the intraocular lens, you may have a problem that unfold in the wrong position. Yeah, very good question. So I, I didn't show it, but on the implant, there is a little bump at the handle, which tells you which side that bump needs to be. So it right. needs to be a certain way. So it has a marker. So you cannot load it upside down. And uh, so that's critical, obviously. Uh, but you know, one thing, Michelle, one of the things is that we've designed it such that if that were to happen for some reason, or we need to remove the implant, we can go grab it, fold it back and take it out. So we've been able to do a lot of, uh, we had to do that for the FDA fold and unfold implant. Um, we can do that. It's obviously not desirable or optimum, but we can certainly remove it should that happen. But it does have a very distinct mark, so you load it properly. Mark, uh, Juliana, I, I would like you? to. Yeah, fine. How about you? Good, thank you. Uh, I I'm gonna tell to to the students that are here that uh, I was with you in '96 and '97 when you were. I think you just finished the fellowship and was just the first year of being a staff at Hopkins. And yes, I, I, we are yes, in, in the room with uh, Eugene Dehuen when he started with the, the probe that has only one photo uh, to stimulate the retina. That's really nice to see all the, the way you went through. Uh, I still uh, want to uh, have a clinical trial for one of your devices in Brazil. Now we have a lot of students that have passed it uh, with you as a fellowship. We are very much prepared for that. But I would like to, to uh, gi give you a question. And after um, the Brent, uh, Brent's paper on the Stargard, uh, I was always wondering if the, the good result would be because of the a growth factor that we raise the cells that go with the, the implant, or if it's really the cells that are doing the job. Because when you say that this nice squirrel can uh, reconstitute their photoreceptor, uh, if we give them the correct factors, we, we might don't need the implant. We can do it like with uh, solutions, injections in the eye. Yeah, what I, do you I, think about I, that? Yeah, no, it's a very good question. I think, there, you know, this is a continuum from very severe to very mild. So if you have a uh, more milder disease, um, you know, just growth factors is, is good, is probably going to work. Um, if you have more severe condition, then uh, you're going to need the RPE cells because um, so the very good, very interesting question, and maybe we should look at this is if you yes, have I a case you of dormant, <laughs> if you have a case of dormant photoreceptor no outer segment if you just uh, give growth factors will it grow an outer segment but remember for the outer segment it needs the rpe to be able to change the trans and cis retinol and so forth and so on so i would say is once you've lost the outer segments i think you need the rpe to bring it back. But if they're just damaged a little bit, I think that the growth factors alone could work. So I think it's really going to be a continuum. And, and we're seeing this effect. It's a very good question. In the area, uh, and this is some of the microperimetry data we'll be publishing, is uh, that not only is there a benefit in the area of geographic atrophy on microperimetry, but also in the our surrounding area where there isn't an implant. So obviously, there's some growth factor effect there. But I think it's going to be a, a continuum. Um, you know, Rodrigo's going to talk about that. If it's milder, 
you just need the suspension uh, of cells and the growth factors. Uh, but if it's more severe, then you need the RPE to be able to then have the outer segment truly function well. Thank you. Good. Nice to see you. Good to see you, Jenny. Mark. Yes. Just one more question about the retinal prosthesis. Uh, we know that it's a very important strategy to increase the number of the electrodes, right? right? But however, what's the limit? Because we know that charge density is a problem, right? What do yes. you think will be the limit of the number of the electrons? That's a good question. So Mauricio is asking is that as the, the number of electrodes get more, we have to make them more compact. We have to fit more of the numbers in the same area. So the electrodes by necessity have to get smaller. And if they get smaller, then uh, the amount of current they can pass is limited because if you keep putting a lot of current through a small electrode, it will dissolve the metal and there will be no electrode left. So well, how are we doing this? And so the, quest, the, the answer to that is you have to get the electrode very close to the retina, Mauricio. When you get it that close, it only requires five microamps of current. If you are not close, it requires 300 microamps. So if you put the okay. electrode very Thank close you. to the retina, you reduce the current requirement, uh, but this has to be, this is a must. We have to get this electrode very close. If it's far away, you leave a lot of vision on the table, as I say to all the surgeons. If you put the electrode array and it is 200 or 300 microns away, you left, you, you lost a lot of vision because you couldn't put the electrodes closer. So we have to work on improving the surgical approach. And that's what we're doing in the new implant uh, to get it closer as well as make the electrode smaller. And Mark, how not, is not, the temperature not. change with the electrodes that we are thinking of? Is uh, the temperature, the retina temperature increases uh, in a way that may be dangerous for the function of the right. uh, transmission? That's a very good question also. That's why we put the uh, chip outside the eye. Most of the heat is being dissipated in the chip. When we put the chip inside the eye, big problems, uh, Michelle. But by putting the chip outside, uh, there's little to no temperature change inside the eye. But this, but this then required the cable to go across the sclera, right? Everybody said, hey, Mark, we don't want this cable. Put everything in the eye. But if you try to put everything in the eye, the temperature is too high and it causes problems. So we do need a small cable, two millimeter incision. Uh, we fold the cable so we can make the incision down to two millimeters. We do a purse string around the cable, but this is all to keep the temperature low and the chip outside. Mark, Mark, great hey. pleasure to see you again. How are Very you nice doing? Nice to see you, Octaviano. <laughs> Excellent presentation. Uh, uh, I don't know if you can talk about the details of this new project, but what are the main points that you are think you should be improved in this new uh, retina chip? Uh, the, well, the main points are exactly what Mauricio was just asking. You know, if you make 256 electrodes, you know, which are four times more than the Argus two, then, uh, you know, how do you make sure that it's close enough so it can provide enough current um, the chip, though, even though it's four times stronger, it's, it's a lot smaller, so we can only put it in one quadrant. Uh, so the technology is there. It looks very, very good, uh, and we'll have some human results. But I think it's, uh, it, uh, it, it's a new design, completely new design than what we've worked with before. Nice. Okay, uh, Mark, Do you use uh, nanotechnology for that? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, we do. We do use nanotechnology to uh, fabricate the electrode coating. Uh, you have to put a nano level scale coating on the electrodes uh, to make this work. Yes. So, uh, Mark, uh, while, while I was there, 2011, uh, we already tested a 256 electrode, but the electronics were far behind. Right. Uh, what uh, allowed you to jump to the 256 electrode is the electronic only, right? 
the size yeah. of the chip, yeah. the the processing capability, everything. The the electrode is the same. Uh, as, no, as the, elect the, the electrode is the electrode is different too, but different. Uh, but uh, but a lot of it had to do with a new chip that we worked on for the last two years. Uh, the chip is built, uh, and so that did take a couple of years. But we have a new chip that can go up to a thousand now and new electrode array. So uh, keep your fingers crossed. So far, it looks good. It lasts at least uh, two years in on benchtop, but we'll see what happens when we get into patient trials. Mark, right. congratulations. It's, it's wonderful. Thanks, Anderson. I, the time when I was in, in, in with you in USC, uh, we had a close uh, research with that. It, the, the big improvement is, is the color. The color was great. We didn't expect that. Uh, do you think we're going to have more improvements about the color? Because we just play with three basic colors about the contracts with the new, this new chip. Yeah. With the high electrodes. I, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But we can certainly get the two to three colors. Uh, can we get six or seven or eight? We'll have to wait and see. But the, the blue green, the sorry, the blue yellow pathway is uh, much easier. Uh, the red green pathway is a little bit more challenging, but the blue green pathway, and this is work we did with Lan and uh, Hossein, uh, is very exciting. And uh, we'll, we just got a paper published on that. So as soon as it's uh, out in print, I'll send it to you guys. Uh, my friends, we would like to share, uh, Mark, uh, some of our data with you. And maybe uh, Rodrigo could start. Uh, we have just a few minutes more. What do you think, Rodrigo? Uh, we have time for that, you think? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, OK. Well, let me try just to show you something then. Uh, can you see the, the screen? Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'll just let you know uh, about the, the work we did here on Stargardt. It's a phase one and two clinical trial. I'll go very uh, fast on it. Uh, we did 12 patients already. Uh, we used embryonic stem cells just like you did. The difference is that we used cell suspension because we didn't have uh, scaffolds to implant it. So this is how it looks in culture. Uh, the RP already differentiated. Uh, the surgery is a lot easier since you don't have to open a little uh, retinectomy to do the surgery. So we just do a blab like you did with the, your, your project, inject the cells, and this is the final result. We can see like this uh, pigmented area uh, in the patients. Uh, we were not able to detach most of the patient's maculas. Uh, I think only two in 12 we were able to do this. And just to show you a few cases, uh, we, we use very end stage target patients. This was the last, the third one, uh, pre-op and post-op. Uh, you can see uh, almost no difference, but we can see a lot, uh, uh, some loss of the RP where we did the injection. And this is something that we saw. Uh, this is their autofluorescent before and after. Uh, in Stargard patients, normally the only retina that's not damaged is around the optic nerve. So that's where we choose to create the blab. And it's really hard to detach those retinas, right? In some patients like this one, we could only detach around the optic nerve. Even that, doing only that, this is how it looks like. One year later, uh, you can see that uh, this is the OCT. You don't see much because there is not much cells injected in this patient, but they improved anyway. Uh, so this may be related to what you said about the dormant photoreceptors. Uh, those patients improved uh, notably. They are doing like functional and daily uh, activities a lot better than before. Uh, we only did the last, the worst eye, and the worst eye now is the best eye. So just to show a few more examples, this one was one we could detach the macula. Uh, you can see like the clumps here of the, of the RP implanted. And in some patients, you can even see like this one, uh, 
uh, residual clumps of uh, pigment here in the upper region where we detached the retina and implanted RP. And this is how they look like after you, you can see a few clumps of cells in the subretinal space. Uh, in our assessment, looks like the retina is thicker in this area only, uh, and they all improved. So fast forwarding everything, this is what I wanted to show you. There's a little bit of retinal thickening where the cells were implanted in all the patients. Uh, and that corresponded roughly to the improvement in the visual field. So you can see uh, this patient came from uh, counting fingers to 20, 150. Even if you have a little bit of uh, atrophy in the injection site, as you can see here, it improved it around the central scotoma. So this is how we look, uh, the visual field of the first six. Some improved it very well to counting fingers to, one, to 20 to 150. And uh, I'll show it like the, all 12 of them. This is how they look before and after. And I think what we're seeing here is related to what you told us. Maybe some of those photoreceptors are not totally gone. They're just dormant. So maybe there's a timing to perform this, th this therapy, even yours. If you wait for all of them to go away, because probably they will eventually become uh, degenerate, you probably won't have any improvement, right? And we saw some, some a kind of that response in the very late stage patients, which was the first ones that they improved less than the, 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 the last ones that had a, a, a better vision and the retina was not all degenerated. So this is what we did. Uh, the surgery is the same, it's very easy. Uh, so I think I'll just end here because we're already late and let you guys comment. Amir, Mark, Hussein, uh, anyone, please uh, give, give us your uh, thoughts about the, the work and what we can improve and what you think. Yeah, I mean, the results are great. I mean, I think the uh, improvement you're getting is I mean you know count fingers to twenty two hundred it you know it's 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 a dramatic improvement um, so let's just uh, and you're not getting a lot of inflammation in the eye which is also good yeah um, so let's see how long it the uh, result lasts I mean it's last one year so we just have four to see. four years already four years oh, yeah okay. they're they're already keeping their vision for four years took them six months to improve. Uh, in the first months, they're complaining a lot of photophobia. They said their vision was worse, and they had a lot of photophobia in the first six months. After six months, they started, they started to improve, and they reached a plateau around eight months, and they, they're keeping that same vision for four years. And the other eye, the, the, the eye that was not implanted, is decreasing. It's following the natural history of the disease, right? No. Yeah. So uh, maybe maybe Osan can comment, but uh, or Juliana, but in star guards the condition is more affecting the photoreceptor, less the RPE. So yes, maybe the RPE is still there doing the phagocytosis, and the additional RPE is providing some growth factors. But it'd be interesting to hear Hosan or Juliana's uh, input. Well, very interesting talk. Um, you know, that's true that photoreceptors are affected, but ultimately, you know, RPE um, also, um, you know, is affected when there's in, in long term. So there is a, you know, definitely um, benefit in that. One question I have is that when I looked at it, the, you did the retinotomy in the, was it in the macular papillar bundle I, I, or you did it away from that? It's just the, just yeah. that in one figure, I saw, yeah. The, the, the first one to detach with BSS was right next to the optic nerve in the uh, popular macular bundle. Then, after we have a blab, we, we went to another site, normally away from, the, from that area, to avoid cell loss. We went through the, bat, through the bubble. Was there any reason that you didn't go a little bit super temporal, infratemporal, instead of just going to the macula? Yes, uh, yeah. that that was the first place we tried to okay. go away from the fovea. You just can't detach. So okay. It's like uh, it's horrible. 
uh, those very uh, big uh, scars you saw in the autofluorescence, we can even predict where is the place in the retina that we can detach. When you see those very big, uh, big areas of scars in the autofluorescence, those areas can't detach ever. Mm -hmm. So we, we tried a way. We never could get a blab in the posterior pole. The only way to get the blab in the posterior pole was doing right next to the optic nerve. Uh, that was something I did also in the pigs for Mark. Uh, the best blabs in the pigs were always next to the optic nerve. Well, I mean, you know, when you're uh, just next to the nerve, instead of going directly in the middle, if you go a little bit above or below, um, the, then probably there would be less, you know, um, nerve fiber layers that would be affected. Uh, Maybe, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you can't you can choose the place where you're injecting in milder cases like the one i saw I show you the picture that case you can detach everything is very easy you can move away but in very end stage cases uh sometimes you just have to go where the autofluorescence tells you there is still viable retina here so sometimes we could not choose uh sometimes the only place where we, we could see that ring of hyper autofluorescence is around the optic nerve is the only place it detaches Sometimes we just got the ring. We didn't got the bubble, you know? We just got the ring of detachment around the optic nerve. I see. Yeah. And one thing that Rodrigo can explain also, I think, Rodrigo, is how is the pressure that you feel uh, from the patients to get it done in the other eye? Oh, yeah. Uh, they, they're, they're pressuring us a lot. Uh, our ethics committee had uh, made us put in the consent form that they were, they could be implanted in the other eye if they thought they had benefit in, in the previous eye. So they all want to get implanted in the other eye. We're just uh, finishing the publication. We'll probably have to implant them in the other eye because they all want that. And because yes. they all, uh, subjectively, they all uh, improve their daily activities by doing this. Yes, this is true. But one, one thing, in, in, by the scientific point of view, we don't know if this uh, improvement of vision, as Mark pointed out, is the anxiety of the patient, the learning effect, or a rescue effect of the cells, remaining cells, or the stem cells by, by themselves. We don't know the, 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 the answer about this. You know? hey, it's not clear for Yes. Uh, so I don't know if you've, uh, you know, we, in our GA study, when we're, uh, first of all, that's really amazing, uh, great results. Um, in our GA study, when we're detaching the area of GA for the stem cell implant, uh, we use a curved subretinal cannula to hydrodissect. And sometimes that allows you to get, I don't know if you've seen that, you've probably seen that. Sometimes that allows you to get into those areas that are not easy to get into. Um, so it, it might be, I don't know if you've tried that. Have you tried kind of targeting the hydrodissection so that you can, um, detach areas rather than just letting the blood go, you might be able to get a more focal treatment response. I mean, I don't know if you, if it's worth it in so, such advanced patients, but that might sure. be something to consider. I can send you the reference. Of course. Yeah. Uh, we tried like a, a few techniques to try to detach that area, but in very end stage patients, we don't even know if it's, uh, it's worth it because what yeah. we saw in the, in the, in the visual fields, they only uh, improved around the area of central scotoma. So if it's very end stage, uh, maybe there's no reason on detaching that area, you know, and it's very thin. Uh, uh, yeah. There was one case I was very uh, concerned about creating a retinal of tear in that area if I push it further. Yeah. So, sure, uh, I think we should try, but yeah, no, in, that's in probably yeah. early, early stages, I think. Sure. Just an idea. Great work, though. Yeah. Thank you. That's it, then. Uh, do we still have time for the other presentations? What do you guys think? Well, I think it's already, uh, we passed already eight minutes from the time that we have in the program. And uh, what do you think, Rodrigo Meirelles-Pira, with 
you think that we should leave the other presentations for another meeting? We are yeah. already two hours and eight meeting, eight minutes in this meeting. Yeah, uh, for me, it's okay. I don't know if uh, everyone has enough time to continue with the presentations. Uh, I don't know if our invited guests think they can continue to uh, with the meeting for a couple of more minutes, or we should uh, uh, just schedule another one for next time. Well, I would suggest we schedule another one because a few, like me, for example, we have other uh, commitments. But you feel free if you want to go ahead. That's no no problems with me. And uh, but we can also schedule another another one. That's uh, that would be also nice. Doctor Mark, Mark, I mean, Hussein, uh, what do you guys think? I would love to hear more, and I, I, I can't stay on, unfortunately, for much longer, but I would say we do another one so that we can take our time and actually, you know, listen to the the, the, the rest of the presentation, because... Yeah. And also, we can to, put more, uh, we have, like, more three presentations from our group uh, in the program, and we could add more uh other works that we are doing instead of three present like five or six and then we can go go over them and discuss uh, more subjects with that our group is doing yes i believe it's better michelle let's rebuild the program and make another uh meeting with them if they are able to do that yes we we we're happy to do it and we will next meeting we will hear more from you and less from us yeah, <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs>